Thank you, uh, Judge Staples. Start the questions. Uh, my first question will be to, uh, to all of the, the nominees um, uh, to, uh, to answer this. The D.C. Uh, court handles a, a very high volume of cases, as uh, each of you know, and vacancies uh, on both the Superior Court and the Court of Appeals have contributed to a significant backlog of, of cases. So my question to each of you is, if confirmed, how will you manage your caseload efficiently while also ensuring that each person who comes before you has a meaningful opportunity to be heard? Uh, I guess we'll start with uh, Judge uh, Patagunta, then uh, Sione Lopez, Ms. Calderon, and then uh, Judge uh, Staples. We'll do it in that order. Thank you for the question, Senator. Um, it is certainly an issue that DC courts face, and I think the best way we can address it is to have judges who are experienced in the courthouse, familiar with um, both the law that's applied in DC, and will able to you know, who are able to hit the ground running. I think as a judge, the most important thing we can do is to resolve each case expeditiously to recognize that we are bound by the law of the DC Court of Appeals and the Supreme Court, um, and to apply that to the law. Um, I also recognize that not all cases need the same amount of time. There are some cases that can be resolved expeditiously, um, quicker than others, and we should, do, we should resolve those. And that way we can leave time toward some of the cases that need more attention. But most importantly, I think, is to roll up your sleeves and get to work. Thank you for the question. Um, I have been on the court for nine years now. Um, magistrate judges handle uh, high volume calendars, and um, I believe that my last nine years will be um, will be crucial on uh, that experience in um, dealing with a calendar um, as an associate judge. Um, I, um, because we've been short staffed, the magistrate judges have actually been called upon to actually uh, be in, in other divisions, which we were normally not uh, serving. Um, and now we serve in all the five divisions of the court. Um, and we also have been very creative in trying to, uh, to do the case management and calendar assignments uh, so that everyone, every, every calendar is covered. So if I am confirmed, I will continue to do what I, I do, um, been doing for the last nine years, which is to come to work every day, to work hard, to make sure that the docket uh, moves and to make sure that everyone is heard um, and, to, and that, to make sure that I um, treat each case and rule um, fair and impartially in each um, each individual case. I was told to move the microphone closer. Can you hear me? Great. Um, with respect to the court of a little closer. With respect to the court of appeals, uh, chairman. Um, it is one, as you probably know, it is one of the busiest uh, state level courts of last resort in the country. And that's uh, due in part to the two tier system we have in DC. The judgments of the Superior Court are all appealed directly to the Court of Appeals without an intermediate court to serve as a filter. And so the, the backlog of cases, the heavy workload is something I've given a lot of thought to. And, um, and you mentioned the vacancies. I think with Judge Thompson's retirement this month, the court will be down about 33% in active judges. Uh, but there are a couple of things that I will do. Uh, first and foremost, I will draw on my managerial experience uh, from the Department of Justice, specifically my uh, role as a deputy chief in the appellate section of the Civil Rights Division, where I had to juggle a high volume of cases uh, along with my other management and administrative duties I had to learn how to prioritize. I had to learn how to triage, so to speak, how to delegate tasks, um, how to supervise. And I think all of that will be directly helpful uh, to me if I am confirmed to run my chambers. The other thing I can do, um, Judge Putakunta mentioned uh, the importance of being able to hit the ground running on day one. And so I have been spending my time trying to learn as much as I can about the court and its docket and its procedures. And I um, will be prepared to hit the ground running on day one and seek the counsel of the fellow judges on the DC Court of Appeals who already have been so generous with their time and uh, giving me tips and pearls of wisdom about how to work efficiently so that uh, justice is not delayed. So I would echo um, the comments of my colleague, Judge Sione Lopez. Um, having been a magistrate for almost the last eight years, I've had, I had the opportunity to serve in many high volume courtrooms 
cover many different courtrooms in the same week um, and, and have many responsibilities at the court. Um, and I would uh, continue to apply um, the skills I've learned in that work um, if I'm confirmed as an associate judge. I would also add that one way I think we can um, deal with a number of cases in our court would be to expand the role of magistrate judges. I know that there are some proposals to do that, and if magistrate judges are able to handle a slightly larger and different variety of cases, I think that would be helpful. Thank you. Thank you to each of you for, the, for your answers. Uh, Ms. Calderon, uh, you have served as an attorney at the Department of Justice uh, for 20 years. Tell the, tell the panel here what challenges you anticipate facing uh, as you shift from the role of an advocate uh, to the role of an impartial adjudicator, and, and uh, how are you preparing for that transition? You mentioned in your last question how you're preparing. Uh, specifically, talk about that. Uh, certainly, Sen uh, Mr. Chairman, thank you for that question. Obviously, the role of advocate is very different from the role of an impartial adjudicator. Uh, that said, I think the role of advocate for the United States government is very different than the role of advocate for private parties. And as I mentioned in my opening, an express part of the department's mission is to ensure the fair and impartial administration of justice. And uh, so I have that experience coming from the Department of Justice. Uh, we do take the rule of law very seriously. Uh, we have a unique responsibility. As an appellate attorney especially, um, you may know that uh, most of the litigating components in the Justice Department have a separate appellate office, and that is by design. Uh, that is because appellate lawyers are obligated to take a fresh look, an objective look at the case when it comes to them on appeal, make an uh, honest assessment of um, the, the facts and the law, and uh, make a recommendation about what the government's position should be. And sometimes that does require an adjustment to the government's position. Sometimes it even requires a recommendation that the government confess error in a particular case. Uh, the biggest difference for me, and the challenge, of course, will be that once I'm uh, on the Court of Appeals, if I'm confirmed, I will no longer have the department's institutional interests to inform my review of a case. Um, I will have to put those aside. I've been talking to some of the current members of the court about this issue and how you have to really um, put aside sort of what you know <laughs> and uh, approach cases totally and completely neutrally and impartially. wrap up here. I have three questions that the committee ask of every nominee, and I'm going to ask each of you to respond briefly with just a yes or no. Uh, we'll start um, uh, when I ask the question here um, with uh, Ms. Calderon and then uh, Judge Staples, uh, Judge uh, Panaguta, and Sione Lopez. So first question, is there anything you are aware of in your background that might present a conflict of interest with the duties of the office for which you have been nominated? No, there is not. No. No. I think we didn't hear you, uh, Siona Lopez of Pusher. No. Second, uh, do you know of anything personal or otherwise that would in any way prevent you from fully and honorably discharging the responsibilities of the office to which you have been nominated? I do not. No. 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 And lastly, do you agree without reservation to comply with any request or summons to appear and testify before any duly constituted committee of Congress if you're confirmed? Yes, absolutely. Yes. Absolutely, yes. Absolutely. Well, thank you for that. Uh, now, uh, I'm going to now recognize um, Senator Lankford, but uh, before I do that, I'll be turning over the chair. We are in the process of uh, voting at other committees, so uh, chairing the, the committee, uh, uh, Senator Hassan will be chairing, but uh, Senator Lankford, you're recognized for your questions. Thank you. Let me ask a question that I'll need 